Hey everyone and welcome back to Ontario Cryptids. Today I have three encounters to share with you all. I think you're really going to enjoy today's episode and if you are enjoying today's episode please remember to hit that subscribe button. If you have an encounter story that you would like to share then please forward your stories to ontariocryptids at gmail.com. I will be honored to share your story with like-minded people. Now sit back and relax as we begin with today's episode. This first one comes from a friend and OC community member, C.W. Well, who resides in Payne County, Oklahoma. Hello V. As of lately, there's been a lot of talk about sleep paralysis and this is something I know a lot about. It used to be called Old Hag Syndrome because people who suffered from it claims that it feels like something is sitting on your chest and some people claim to see an old witch looking entity at the foot of their bed, hence the Old Hag. I have had sleep paralysis most of my life, with it getting more often the older I get. When it first started I would be asleep but alert that I was asleep and I would have the classic symptoms of something on my chest. But as I got older the experience would intensify. I would be asleep, I knew I was asleep and I have the feeling of pure fear, not like a snake startling me but a primal intense fear, like was about to face the devil. In my mind, I was telling myself to wake up. You, wake up now. It was like I was in the back seat of my own body and someone else was driving. More than once, I would be asleep and I would begin to have a sleep paralysis event. And I could hear surgical equipment buzzing in my ear and I could feel like I was being operated on without any sedation. It was scary. And when I finally woke up, I checked myself to make sure I was not operated on. The last time I felt like I was operated on was in February, and a few days later, I was admitted to the hospital where I was performed x-rays, and the x-ray shows no sign of recent injuries. I'm convinced that a lot of people confuse alien abduction for sleep paralysis. A month after that encounter, I was asleep and I had another sleep paralysis episode. This time, I felt like in the presence of pure evil. I tried to make myself wake up, but I couldn't. When I finally woke up, I seen the hag, but it wasn't a hag. It was like what most people think that the devil looks like. The last episode was a few weeks ago, and I had dozed off while watching The Andy Griffin Show. And in this episode, my brother was hitting me on the head. My brother lives across the state, and I always lock my doors, even during the day. There's too many druggies that travel down my road and I plan on keeping my stuff. I know that it wasn't a dream. I was trying to tell myself that I needed to wake up and I know that my door is locked and my brother is across the state. As I started to research sleep paralysis, I have discovered that all of the people who have more than one sleep paralysis episode per year experience a fear like they have never experienced before or after. It's only during sleep paralysis that they experience this fear. I can't describe how bad the fear is besides, it's like you're about to face the devil himself. I was told in February that I have been having many strokes and I have had a couple of mild strokes, but these sleep paralysis episodes have happened to me for more than 20 years. As far as I know, I'm the only one in my family that has sleep paralysis and I hope that I'm the only one. I would not wish it on anybody. Most people won't talk about it. They're afraid of judgment. But I don't care what people think. My judge will judge all of us one day. One idea I heard about claims that sleep paralysis is something demonic by nature. I don't know if that's true or not. I am superstitious about certain things, such as I won't sleep next to an open window. And I have an iron doorknob, not a brass like most doorknobs. Certain things from the brimstone realm doesn't like touching iron. Every place I have lived except for a couple places, I have had a donkey. I am not superstitious about black cats or certain numbers, but I do believe that certain places can be cursed for whatever reason. I have seen ghosts and I've worked on a haunted ranch. 
but nothing I have experienced has came anywhere close to the fear I experience when I have a sleep paralysis episode. I have seen ghosts and I've worked on a haunted ranch, but nothing I have experienced has come anywhere close to the fear I have experienced when I have a sleep paralysis episode. This next one takes place very recently, uh, so in 2023. We're going to be heading to Lake County, Oregon at the Heart Mountain Hot Springs Campgrounds. I have a friend who called me on Friday who knows I am into this kind of thing. They were in shock at what they had seen and wonder if I had any idea as to what it could be. I figured I would share it here to see if anyone else has any ideas. Here is what they shared with me. I was camping at Heart Mountain Hot Springs. At 8.64 a.m., I was leaving my campsite by foot to use the nearest bathroom. The campsite sits above a field overlooking the road that runs west to other campsites, a field, creek, and the three hot spring pools. I looked across the field and saw an animal. It was at least 200 feet away. I thought it was a wild horse but there are no wild horses in the Heart Mountain National Antelope Refuge. This animal's body was facing me, south, with its head turned slightly to its left. I thought it was a horse because it had a black mane of hair and its body was brown and shiny. It appeared to be about the size of a yearling at first. I say at first because later I saw a human man in the same location, there's a path there from the west campsite that travels to the parking lot by the east campsites, and I now believe the creature was about 7 to 8 feet tall. It turned its head right directly towards me, then it turned its body leftward, east, and walked across the parking lot towards the bridge across the creek, and I lost sight of it in the trees. It was bipedal. It did not move quickly, walking with its back slightly forward and its arms swinging at its sides. I later looked for footprints. The ground was too hardened to find any. I crossed a bridge and walked a little up the creek north, looking for any evidence like hair, and I could not locate anything. What do you think? My only thoughts are either a person dressed in some kind of a ceremonial gear or animal skin, although the height makes that unlikely, or an animal with chronic wasting disease, which also seems unlikely given that it was bipedal. This last encounter of the day takes place in Spokane County, Washington, and the nearest town is Lyons. The date is unknown. This is a true story, and I've been kind of obsessing over what the F happened out there. I'll try to keep it as brief as possible without leaving out any key details. I grew up deep in the mountains of Shoshone County, an hour from a grocery store. The wilderness is my peace and my home. But these woods, they are evil, and I never should have come to Washington. My wife's uncle, Jay, bought some land just north of Spokane, Washington, with a friend of the family, Kay. They got it at a significant discount because a nearby aluminum smelter had polluted the grounds and it was impossible to use the water beneath the ground. They had set up two plots and each had a camper to live in. Jay had been progressively getting paranoid and saying people were stalking him and watching him in the trees. About three months into living there, a man wandering through the woods there had an interaction with Jay and ended up attacking him and breaking his jaw. Upon being arrested, the man said that he was overcome with a desire to see if he could kill him in a single punch. Two months later, Jay was murdered in his sleep on the couch in his camper. Kay found him and immediately ran as far away until he stopped to call the police. There was significant evidence of who did it, and they quickly caught the killer who was a 19-year-old boy who said he simply wanted his bike. 
He beat him to death with a power tool that was laying on his floor nearby, completely smashed his brains in. Kay was completely terrified at all times to be there alone. He moved in with a family member until eight months later and he ended up with nowhere else to go and had to return. In constant fear, he finally convinced my pregnant wife and I to come and stay with him. The second I turned off the highway onto the property, I was overcome with dread. There were at least 250 crows covering the dirt road up to the property. I didn't sleep whatsoever the first night. I stared into the forest searching for the cause of my intense fear. The energy of this place was so uncomfortable I assumed it was simply just knowing Uncle Jay was killed here. Even the days were eerie. Never did I have a moment where I didn't feel watched here. My wife and I always had a sense of fear, especially after dark. Things sort of normalized for a while until one day Kay began puking and feeling very lightheaded all the time. I took him to the hospital and they said that he was fine, probably a flu. At this point, it was the anniversary of Jay's murder. Three days after the date of Jay's death, Kay comes running out of his camper screaming, I can't breathe, waking my wife and I up and we ran out to see what was wrong. Kay had gotten into his car and floored it, crashing it into a nearby tree. I ran up and peered through the window to see the most intense and most primal fear I've ever seen in someone's eyes. He was gasping and clutching his chest. Moments later, he breathed out one last time and he was dead. We gave him CPR for 30 minutes until EMS arrived. On July 10th, one year and three days after moving in there with Jay, they were both dead. Now, it's only me and my wife alone on the property. Every moment living in fear and not understanding what had happened here. I don't know why I didn't leave right away. One day, I come out to get fresh water from the drum that we kept for water to smell the worst smell I've ever smelt. The water container had an inch opening on top, and inside the water was bits and pieces of chipmunks, like spines and heads. They didn't fall in. Something ripped them apart before putting them inside. The nights were getting worse and worse. I never saw anything other than shadows messing with my eyes. I was nearly always filled with unease, intense fear. Fear in the woods, even at night, is new for me. We all get a little spooked in the thick of the wilderness in pure darkness. But compared to my home, this wasn't even a wilderness. The snapping of branches and pine needles crunching underfoot haunted me every night. The screeching owls loved to chime in right at the height of anxiety. My nights were spent peering into the pines, watching, always waiting for whatever evil to present itself. I knew it was out there, and it wanted me to know it too. One night, my wife and I returned home to having the worst feeling I have ever felt. Every second driving up that long dirt road increased my anxiety tenfold. Something bad was ahead, and it was clear. The thick fog shrouded the pines. If it wasn't for the glimmer of the full moon, it would have been pitched black. Everything looked different. Although it was right where we left it, nothing seemed in place. Looking around, I suddenly see this orange longed hair mange cat sitting on a stump. This cat's eyes were so intense, fiery almost, glowing but not quite. The cat in my mind was the embodiment of pure evil. I saw darkness in its soul. We started hearing branches snapping, pine needles crunching, seemingly from every direction. The brush was swaying back and forth, clearly indicating something was running within. Here I am, still staring at this cat, almost frozen in fear. Suddenly a voice breaks out, echoing through the forest. Hello? Is anyone out there? A little girl, I thought, but something was off. My gaze finally breaks with the cat and my eyes dart towards the road. My wife yells back, Hello? Are you okay? Anybody? The voice had changed. Help! Help me! It was the same person or thing yelling, but as if it was trying to disguise its voice. We yelled back several times without response. Somebody, effin' help me. 
the most intense, shrieking, evil-sounded voice of a woman, it cut deep into my body. I'm filled with more intense fear than I can ever describe. But my wife? She is overcome with the need to find this person. And she started to head off into the forest without a word. I grabbed her by the arm to tell her something isn't right. Why won't she respond to us? She tries to break free from me to go off alone. I tell her to get into the truck and I'll grab the spotlights. We aren't going on foot. We roll the windows down and shine my intense bright LED light throughout the forest. We slowly creep down the road yelling back. As we get further down the road, the voice strikes out, Please! Won't anyone effin' help! The sounds are difficult to pin down in the woods, but this one was very close. I hit the brakes and stop immediately. We shine the light and yell back searching. No signs of anyone when suddenly this voice explodes into the cabin of the vehicle as if it were standing right outside my window. Help me! Somebody effin' help! Leaving my ears hurting and ringing, I hit the gas and I did not look back. We called the police when I hit the highway and afterwards they said there was no one around. I picked up our stuff the next day and my wife gave birth the following day. We never stayed there again after the baby was born. What the hell could do these things? I never even believed in paranormal things before, but I don't know what else can do these things. P.S. We decided to have her blood tested while living there. No toxic metal levels were found on us or J or K's autopsy report. As simply as it seems, nobody had any poisoning whatsoever. I hope you all enjoyed today's episode. CWL, thank you for sharing, and I hope your health improves and your sleep paralysis goes away. I'm not sure what the campers witnessed or what happened to J or K and their family member who moved onto the property. That is a real mystery. If these stories reminded you of an encounter that you may have had and would like to share, then please forward your stories to ontariocryptids at gmail.com. I would be honored to share your story on this channel. Thank you all for listening until the end. I truly appreciate it. Please hit the like button on your way out and smash the subscribe button if you're new to my channel. Have a great weekend and I hope to see you all next week right here on Ontario Cryptids.